morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you wherever you are joined from around the globe. My name is Charity Nyongwekaru and Modi and I'll be the moderator for today's uh, discussion. Uh, today is a very important discussion where we will be discussing the customary law and the constitution and specifically the roles that parliament play to ensure that women rights are observed. This is our 69th panel discussion. You're most welcome and you're free to send in your contributions to our chat groups and we will be able to respond accordingly. Our panelists for today, we have Honorable Dr. Anito, Honorable Betty Achano Oguaro, and Honorable Hannah Lona. Before I deeply introduce our great panelists for today's session, I would like to take you through a few highlights about customary law in the Republic of South Sudan. Customary law, these are rules, beliefs, or customs, or norms that governs the relationship of members of different communities. Now, different communities have come to believe and accept these norms, and as such, it has become a law or a binding law in the Republic of South Sudan. The characteristics of these customary laws are that largely they are unwritten, and it varies from it from different tribes from one tribe to the other they are not uniform in nature that's what we're trying to say here and that they must have existed at least for a very long time or at least it must have existed from the material time from the time of its application now in our different societies especially in the republic of south sudan many people the majority of of south sudanese are more uh, give more respect and accord to the customary laws of this country. And that is the reason why we are here today to discuss such. So you will realize that these customary laws have a fresh impact on the areas of personal laws that affect every South Sudanese, especially on issues to do with the majority age, on issues to do with inheritance, on issues to do with marriage, on issues to do with guardianship, and so on and so forth as our panelists will be taking you through as we will be starting. Now, you will realize that we have only 24.9% of our women of our women as members of parliament all over the world. And you you know we all we're all aware that in the parliament that is where most of the legislation, so at least the legislations that govern every country is drawn or where the discussions start. So you will realize that because of the 24.9%, this is a very few number, it's a very few number, and so because of that, you will realize that some of the laws that will come out will be not will not uh, literally bring out the Bill of Rights or the things that we need that will protect the women in the Republic of South Sudan or even in other countries. So we want to understand from our honorable members of parliament today, what roles can the, can the parliamentarians play in as far as uh, protecting women rights in the Republic of South Sudan? With that brief background, I will go straight and introduce our panelists for today. I'll start off with Dr. Anito. Dr. Anito is currently the Honorable Member at the East African Legislative Assembly. She is a PhD holder. She has a PhD degree in entomology from the University of Manhattan in Kansas. She has previously worked as advisor to the President of the Republic of South Sudan on Agriculture and Food Security. She also previously served as a State Minister of Agriculture and Forestry in the Government of National Unity from 2005 to 2007. She also served as Minister of Agriculture and Forestry in the Government of South Sudan. She has been very active in the SPLM uh, party where she worked as the, she was elected as the SPLM Deputy Secretary General for South, for Southern Sector. And in that process, she was covering Southern Sudan, Southern Blue Nile, and the Luba, and the Luba, uh, the Luba Mountains. Honorable Anito was assigned as a member of the SPLM delegation to the peace negotiations. And she was also the advisor to the SPLM Economic Commission on Agriculture and Natural Resources. She has worked previously with different international and national organizations, including USAID, 
So we are very grateful and, and happy to have you here in this discussion and we'll be hearing more from you. Our second panelist of today is Honorable Betty Achano Guaro. Honorable Betty Achano Guaro is a dedicated member of parliament in the Republic of South Sudan. She's a renowned woman activist and a trained uh, mediator and negotiator in the Republic of South Sudan. She is a specialist on developmental issues with over 30 years of experience in rural and sustainable development. She is also a microbiologist and a researcher. She worked in this government as a former Minister of Agriculture. She also worked in the Ministry of Animal Resources and Veterinary Services. She has been a founding member of different organizations and also a founder of uh, South Sudan Women Parliamentary Caucus, that was uh, in 2006. She also founded the South Sudan Women Leaders for Peace and also founded the South Sudan Women Peace Network. She's also a board member of different national and international organizations, including the international, including the Global Network of Women uh, Builders. Our third panelist for today is Honorable Hannah Lona. Honorable Hannah Lona is the chairperson board of directors of Mother and Child Development Association, Juba. She holds a diploma in rural development and community studies from Juba University. She previously served as the acting speaker and deputy speaker in Western Equatorial Legislative Assembly and various parliamentary committees since 2005. We are glad to have you here, all our dear panelists. Moving forward, we shall now be going into our discussions for today. Just to remind you, it will be about customary law and the constitution and what roles parliament play to ensure women rights are observed. We shall start off with Dr. Anito. Dr. Anito, we have a few questions for you. I'll read out those questions to you, and then you'll be able to give your opinions on those questions for a period of 25 minutes, and we'll be shifting on to the next panelist. Your question number one is, how do customary law and the constitution influence each other? Are the rules of customary law in line with the principles in the Bill of Rights in South Sudan? Kindly provide some examples from the East African community. Our question number two. I am sure you and your colleagues have gained a lot of insights of constitutional rights that support or object customary laws from the East African Legislative Assembly. What are the examples that you would advise our South Sudanese women parliamentarians to fight the negative customary laws? Our question number three. The lack of women independence by tradition has been one of the greatest threats to women progress. What would be some of the mechanisms to promote and guarantee women advancement in the face of customary laws? Our question number five will be, now that the process of the South Sudan permanent constitution is ongoing, how would the female parliamentarians ensure that they have involved both in the in both in the parliament and outside of the parliament for the greater achievement of the bill of rights in our constitution and lastly our last question is appreciating that the east african community treaty has got a number of articles that call for enhancing the role of women in socioeconomic development and calls for enactment of legislation to what extent has it been implemented within the legal framework of South Sudan? And what recommendations can you offer going forward? Over to you, Dr. Anito. I hope that these questions were with you before. So you can kindly give us your reports so that we can have a deep understanding of this. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I would have loved it if you, you know, you read out question separately. Okay. But, uh, so that you remind me of what I'm supposed to be. Thank you very much, uh, viewers. Uh, it is indeed a very great honor and pleasure to be with you and uh, 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 give my insights about these very fundamentally important issues that affect not only women, but whatever, because whatever affects women affects the family, and whatever affects the family affects the whole country. 
Now, the important thing to know here is that both customary law and uh, constitution are made to regulate the lives of people. The difference being, as said before, the customary law uh, is known for, uh, by, the, by a community for a very long time and that they know it very well and it has become a way of life and, and, and it's known. People know it very well, they practice it, it becomes a habit, it becomes norms. And the unfortunate thing is not all, I mean, uh, one thing I should say is I admit that not all customary uh, systems are bad, but there are a few that really infringes on the rights and the freedoms of women and others actually promote uh, you, uh, uh, you know, harmful practices against women, just like wife inheritance, uh, uh, depriving young girls from going to school, depriving widows from uh, custody of their children or inheritance. Those are really bad. On the other hand, the South Sudanese constitution is premised around the international rights and freedoms, which means there should be no discrimination between men and women, there should be justice, there will be fairness, and everybody's uh, rights should be valued. And this is very well premised in uh, Article 14, Article 15, and Article 16 of our Constitution. All these constitutions, I mean the articles actually, guarantees equality, guarantees the life, uh, the right to family, but also guarantees that women should have, should agree when it comes to time of marriage. It also guarantees that women should participate in government. So really, uh, the influence here is the customary law influences, infringes on the values of the constitution. And that is where the problem lies. And it's where we should focus. Now, this is why also, even though the constitution exists, but because mm -hmm. people are so used to the tradition and they are so pure into it, they find it very difficult to move on to practice the constitution. So to me, this is the most important thing, uh, where the constitution actually, where the customary law actually affects the constitution. It infringes on the values, and that means the women are not protected, despite the, 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 the Article 16 of the Bill of Rights, despite that. Even despite the child act, we still have children being married off. Despite the penal court that actually criminalizes uh, rape, you still have rape not being punished. It's because we are keeping to our customer system. Thank you very much. I think I'll move on to the second question. Yes. Can you repeat the question number two for me? Thank you very much. Question number two. I am sure you and your colleagues have gained a lot of insight of constitutional rights that support or object customary laws from the East African Legislative Assembly. What are the examples that you would advise our South Sudanese women parliamentarians to fight the negative customary laws? Uh, thank you very much. Right away, on the onside, I want to say that South, Sudanese, South Sudan is not the only country where the constitution recognizes and legitimizes customer law. There are so many other, in fact, the, the majority of the countries in Africa recognizes customer law. Take, for example, Liberia and Malawi uh, and Namibia. They recognize customary marriages, but it is supervised by the government. And also in Namibia, the constitution recognizes uh, the National House of Chiefs. It's recognized. But they regulate, they limit clearly the powers these uh, uh, chiefs should have. In Somalia, for example, the charter actually requires that people who are going to be MPs must be passed by the chiefs. So, you know, it's not only South Sudan. The only difference is, however, in most African countries where constitution is, sorry, where the constitution recognizes uh, the customary law, they prohibit 
They prohibit customs and tradition and practices that contradicts the constitution. Or either the constitution, or statutory laws, or uh, public order, or anything that is passed by the government. If any law contradicts, sorry, if the customary law contradicts the constitution and statute, the law order from the president, it is now considered non and void. And that is very, very important. Uh, now, what else can MPs do? It's not only the constitution, sorry, the customary law does not only uh, contradict the constitution, but some of the laws which actually provides, like the Child Act and the Penal Code, that uh, provides for, for the protection of uh, women, they are not implemented. They are there, but they are not implemented. Why? It's because even those who are supposed to implement it, they are they they meant that they mentally they operate within the custom, customary law system. And very often you find very uh, very light punishment given to rapists, very light punishment given to somebody who uh, have illegally made the game custody, sorry, custody of their children. So really, the issue here is, what do we do as MPs? We need to really go through the constitution. We need to go through all the laws that are meant to protect uh, women. And we need to find if there are some gaps. Our own constitution uh, recognizes the, the customary law but there is no prohibition. If at least the constitution will pro uh, prohibit anything that contradicts the constitution, then at least we'll be protected. At least the constitution will be taken care of that. But that's not enough. It's not, it's not easy to implement the constitution. Very often the con constitution is reinforced by a set of laws that really will protect women. Child Act is one of them. But in other countries you have uh, family, fam fa family law. But also, uh, you know, uh, even uh, the, the penal code, you, you know, it forbids uh, rape, but it doesn't call rape rape. It doesn't include rape committed on a woman, a woman done by her own husband, because customary law doesn't look at that as rape. So we really need to go through the constitution. We need to go and find out whether the, uh, it covers. Uh, our rights well, and if there is any contradiction, if there are gaps, and we also need to look at the law to see if it covers all our rights, and if it doesn't, if there are some gaps, we should now, as MPs, begin looking at how we can fill these gaps by bringing up bills to protect ourselves. So that is very, very important. If, and also, one thing is, people don't, don't just give up habits. It's, it takes a lot of working to get people to move away from their cultures and traditions and begin respecting the law. One, it happens when we do legal education. We need to really get everybody to a greater extent understand what the constitution is about, what the protection of the women is about. We have to talk about the Child Act, and if there is family law, people really need to understand what happens if you violated the punishment as well. But also you need to talk about the harmful practices, how it affects children, how it affects women, but how it affects the whole community. If we fall short of that, women will continue to lose their rights and women will be dished very harm, a lot of harmful practices that does not benefit them, but also it doesn't benefit children, it does not benefit. Question. Next question. Thank you so much, Honorable. Your next question is The lack of women independence by tradition has been one of the greatest threats to women's progress. What would be some of the mechanisms to promote and guarantee women advancement in the face of the customary rules? Okay. Uh, for me, uh, in South Sudan, the biggest problem is awareness. Lack of awareness about the laws, it's very, very important. But also institutions, 
that are supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, implementing the rule of law. A lot of them uh, also lack awareness about uh, the rights of women and about the freedoms of people. So that is also a big weakness. But uh, some of them are not even well, uh, you know, equipped. They, you know, if something has gone wrong and uh, they need to investigate, uh, they will not have the capacity and the facility to go and do that. So really, even the institutions uh, of rule and law of law need to be aware, need to be facilitate, facilitated so that uh, they can actually enforce the rule of law uh, to protect uh, the rights of women. But another very important thing is in some countries, the, the Ministry of Gender and Social Welfare take the front line position in really educating, informing, and fighting and bringing up laws that will protect women. So that, that uh, institution, sorry, that government institution is also very important. In our case, maybe because it's not well funded, uh, they are not doing as much as is required in order to change people's habits. And when that habits change is when the women will begin feeling they are protected. So that's important. But really, no matter, uh, you can talk as much as possible about as others, but women themselves. Women parliamentarians have a role to play as an institution, as a mechanism. They have caucus, there is a, a, a parliamentary women caucus here. And there is also in East Africa, uh, legislative assembly, there is women parliamentary. This is a mechanism that can bring together the voices, the experiences, they can even do research, they can educate, they can argue that the laws that are existing are not enough and we need laws A, B, C, D to be able to guarantee women their rights and their freedom and to protect them from harmful practices. But also we have a lot of, uh, there is this uh, women union and so on. In, um, in Rwanda, there is a women's council. They are organized from uh, the grassroots up to the national, uh, national level. This women's council, as a mechanism, really carries the voice and fights for the rights of women, advises the government, advises everybody about where women are and what should be done for women. And, uh, and they, they really achieve a lot in, in terms of creating space for women's uh, voice, but also creating space so that women can participate and also protecting women. So really, we have institutional setup, which is there, but they're not working enough to make sure that uh, the right legal uh, framework exists, but also this legal framework is implemented fully in order to pro provide protection to the women. So it's very, very, those people need to work very hard. The parliament, and in our case, is a women association, but it gives its renamed, but that is a body that really brings on board everything. They must do research to make sure they find out what are really the issue, and what is the extent of the issue, what is the extent of the abuse, what is the extent of the marginalization, what is the extent of discrimination. Without it, it's very difficult to argue, and even to show sense to parents and uh, people at the grassroots level, if they're able to see the harm that is done to their children, their girls, their wives, maybe they will be ready to change. So we really need to step up our games and uh, really work actively to face this um, uh, customary law, particularly those that uh, discriminate against women. Thank you very much, Dr. Hani for, for, for that contribution. Just before we move on to our next question, like question number five, question number four, I have a comment to, to put across. Uh, appreciating that we come from a very dominant kind of a system, the patriarchy system, where you, you realize that the men literally dominate all aspects of our lives, including from, right from the social, the religious, the economic, and all that. You find that the women are always behind. 
Now, because of the rooted importance of or the, the, the customary laws taking roots in different communities, you will realize that women go through so many challenges and so they are always left behind and they are not independent enough to bring out their voices. I would like to say that uh, several organizations, like you mentioned, civil society organizations have advised, they have created awareness <coughs> and all that. But still, you realize that the women themselves are the ones who are, again, trying to promote this kind of customs. They could be having the reasons as to why they are doing that, maybe for fear of being discriminated from the society or different other reasons. It could also be ignorance. So you will find that in the villages, for example, people know that the majority age should be 18. But when you when a, a mother allows her child to get married at the age of 12 or at the age of 8, then you ask her, why did you allow that? Then she will stand strongly and even protest that there is completely nothing wrong with that because that is the custom or the tradition of that particular community or society. Now, these are women themselves. So, if, with your experience from the East African community, what can you say about that? A situation where the women themselves are not giving the platform, or they are not making it easy for now the activists and all the other groups to ensure that we advance their rights, we move them out of those customary laws that are repugnant to their justice. Thank you very much. You know, the, the situation you're expressing is not unique to South Sudan. It is the same in Uganda, the same even in, was the same in Rwanda until it changed. The one thing is don't expect too much from a woman because a woman lives in a patriarchal system and she needs to be accepted. If she's not accepted, where, the, where do you want her to go? She will feel, feel, really feel lost. So really the problem is not just women. The problem is changing the whole society and men especially. The men should also get to understand what uh, the customs dishes out to their own children and their wives is not fair. So really, for me, I would not open my eyes only on women because they are victims of the same patriarchal system. We should talk to the people who enjoy the powers of this system so that uh, they can release relate with some of these powers to the women and the girls. But without them understanding the importance of giving freedom and giving a chance for women to participate, it will not be possible. The focus is changing the society. The chiefs, they, they have a say, they have a lot of say in all these things that happen to the lives of people in the rural area. So for me, it's, it should be comprehensive. The target should not only be women, because women themselves are victims. Thank you very much, Dr. Anne. We can now move on to our next question, which is question number four. Now that the process of the South Sudan permanent constitution is ongoing, how would the female parliamentarians ensure that they are involved in and from the outside of the August House for the greater achievement of the Bill of Rights to be part of the constitution? Thank you very much. Indeed, by the virtue of the office, the people's representatives, they bring on board, uh, they bring on board the, 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 the aspirations of the people, the challenges of the people, they bring on board a lot of things. But for them to be able, for them to be able to really critically contribute to the process of uh, uh, constitutional making, they should first educate themselves with the current constitution. What is there that they want there? What is not there that they want to be on board? What is there but it's ugly and they want removed? That is very, very important. They need to really inform themselves about the provisions in the constitution. Once that is done, they need to go to the people. Each one of those uh, members of parliament have a constitution. But if the parliament show, creates an environment where the MPs can do it together, fine. But if not, each MP needs to go and find out what are the issues that is being ex expressed. What would their own people want to see in this constitution, which is actually a covenant between the people and the government? 
It's very, very important. If it's permanent, it's, going, it's not going to be changed. Every agreement is going to be there. So the first thing is understand the, the current constitution. Find out what is positive and what is negative and whether there are any gaps. Then go to listen to your people. Bring on board their voices so that the process that you are going to uh, embark in is informed by the wishes of the people. Because if you sit alone and do it, you will not be represented. But also, it's not enough to hear from the people and understand the constitution. The constitution goes through a lot of debates. You know, in parliament, uh, you cannot, you cannot, you know, you have to debate, you have to uh, argue your case to a point that somebody next to you will say, yeah, I agree with you, and then it will be passed. If any of you do a very good research, if you are unable to stand there with evidence to say why, argue in front of the rest that this needs to change, then nothing will be changed, and then you will not have been able to represent your people. So it's very, very important that they are alert, uh, they inform themselves about the constitution, they inform about the, uh, the wishes of the people, and then they organize themselves so that they can push into the constitution through the processes of debate and so on. Otherwise, they will not be doing enough. So it's very, very key, it's very important, and they must be there at every process of the constitution making process, every stage of the constitution making process. Thank you very much, Dr. Anne. We will, move in, we will be moving on to our last question. And our last question is, appreciating that the East African Community Treaty has got a number of articles, including Article 151, that specifically calls for the enactment of legislation to eliminate discriminatory traditions and cultural practices. South Sudan being a member of the East African Community, to what extent has this been implemented within our legal framework in South Sudan, and if not, what recommendations can you offer going forward? Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, what stands like a constitution in the East African community is the treaty for the establishment of the East African community. And in that treaty, there are two articles, Article 121 and Article 122, that really calls for uh, uh, re recognizing the role that women play in social and economic development and therefore removing any obstacles, any traditions and customs that prevents her from her exercising her rights and her participation. And Article 122 talks about the role of women in businesses and that all our, our, our laws should ensure that uh, women have equal access to financial services, to, uh, to financial resources. Now, if I come back to our own legal framework, apart from the Constitution, I'm not, maybe Betty, uh, Honorable Betty can come in here later on, there is nothing specific uh, uh, removing, sorry, uh, promoting the participation of women, sorry, uh, nothing specific that, nothing specific in our legal framework that really deals with eliminating uh, obstacles that prevents women from participation. I know that uh, Article uh, 16 of our Constitution is very clear, but there is no law to help implement it. There is a provision in the Constitution, but there is no law to, prevent, uh, to help implement it. And that is very, very important. These are things maybe can be covered in the family law, or it can be a law by itself that would uh, uh, give uh, an expression to allowing women to, uh, to, to have access to resources and also participate effectively. You know, uh, in other countries, beyond the constitution, they have what they call gender equality law. Gender equality law would actually protect women and actually promote 
equal access as well. But we don't have that gender equality law as well. So to me, uh, our parliament here, or our MP here, have a lot of ground uh, where we need to look critically at how best we can improve uh, the status of women and also the freedom of women uh, and then chances for women to involve either in government or many things. Otherwise, uh, the constitution alone will not be helpful, particularly if there is no pro pro prohibition of the customary law. Because uh, let's, let, 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 let's agree that most of our women operate under the custom, customary system. They are in the villages, they are in the counties, where the first instance of court system is the traditional uh, customary law. So whatever that law uh, dishes out of that, it is what they would experience. So really, our job is very, very important. We need to see how best to have this pro uh, prohibition uh, clause or article in the Constitution uh, for those harmful practices. Uh, in the customary uh, tradition and practices. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Dr. Anito, for your able submission, for all the questions that you have uh, ably answered in this discussion. And I believe and hope that our viewers uh, have followed it critically to help them in their various uh, activities. Uh, we'll be moving forward to our next panelist. Our second panelist for today's discussion is Honorable Betty Achan. Honorable Betty Achan, you're most welcome, and I'll take you through the first question. Our first question, Honorable, is Parliament play a crucial role. Parliament play a crucial in advancing gender equality and women in parliament are known to be the main drivers of change in terms of gender in parliament. Representation of social diversity, holding the executive account, the executive to account rather, drafting relevant and adequate legislation, and drawing attention to specific issues are all important functions that parliaments perform and are vital in achieving gender equality. Do you think the women parliamentarians in Sudan are playing the above role? If yes, can they? Uh, can we? Can we achieve? What can we achieve in the past uh, ten years in advancing the rights of women? What have we achieved? Oh, thank you very much, um, and also thank you viewers for uh, attending this session. Uh, of course, this is following up a customary law discussion with the lawyers did last week, and it is a very important um, discussion. Your question about parliaments playing a very crucial role in advancing gender, gender equality, and women in parliament are known to be the main drivers of change. This is what should be in a normal circumstance. In a normal circumstance, women in parliament to drive the women's rights and women's equality. But what is happening in our parliament in South Sudan, because first of all, when we came from, uh, uh, from the war, the CPA stated that there should be equal rights for men and women. And then when we came to make the interim uh, constitutional uh, uh, interim constitution of South Sudan in 2005, we translated the CPA into the constitution. Of course, we adapted uh, most of the things from the Sudan, but we also took out things that were not re relevant to South Sudan, especially things related to the uh, Islamic laws, we took them out. But the, the, the things that were in CPA, they were also translated into the constitution about uh, South Sudan will draw its sources of values, customs, and traditions, particularly the personal status and family laws from the customary law. So it is in the constitution. Now, the constitution also 
uh, says the different levels of government uh, should enact this law and adapt it to their relevant uh, conditions. As you had stated in the beginning, uh, customary laws are not the same all over South Sudan. So every state has to tweak this customary law to to meet its state, but make sure that they uh, respect the rights uh, of women. Of course, the book says one thing, the practice is another thing. We are living in a patriarchic society, even if the book says, uh, for example, a man who has committed a rape should be put into prison, customary law, for example, in Eastern Equatorial, we say no, this man should marry the girl so that the, the, the girl should still be respected in the community. So many boys would begin to rape because they want to marry a girl who does not like them. So customary laws are good. Some of them are good to take us forward, but some of them are very bad. So what do women in parliament do? First of all, I must say, we need a lot of work in the parliament of South Sudan. Although we have surpassed 25% representation, we have not surpassed 50% uh, of women who can read and understand the constitution and translate it properly. We have not surpassed even 25% of the women who have courage to stand up in parliament and argue against uh, an article that is not right. So in parliament, we still need to do a lot of work. We need to train the women. We need to encourage the women. We need to build the confidence of the women so that they should do more than what they're doing now. At the moment, yes, there are the women who are talking in the parliament, challenging uh, parts of the constitution. But also, you should uh, be aware that uh, South Sudan is a country also that does not allow or does not accept people openly. Uh, pointing out what is wrong. The women in the parliament have fought very, very hard to see to it that certain customs that are not right, they will bring it up in the parliament. And they are certain. But sometimes in the parliament, as uh, Honorable Ahmad said, sometimes the voices of a few women are not respected or are not accepted by all the women. So we need a critical mass that flow together in order for them really to move and be drivers of change, change in the parliament. Secondly, women alone cannot change the parliament. We are talking of 25%, 25% say 30% of 500 people. That's 100 people. When we come to voting, the other 400 will defeat the 100 people. So women must now educate men on the dangers of uh, the, the bad part of the customary law. Because a lot of our men, they are educated, but they, they still live and rule themselves with the customary law. So education in the class is not enough. We need to have education also about the, the reality of life and what we need to change from the customary and traditional laws so that we have uh, peace and progress for women in the parliament. I can say some of the things that women in the parliament uh, in South Sudan have done, for example, they, they really managed to even uh, convince the army that if a military man uh, rapes and there is a clear case, this man should go to, uh, to, to court. And I think there were two cases that the, the women parliamentarians pursued with the, uh, with the military and it happened. And they also pursued in the community. If community members come and accuse that a man has raped their daughter under age or what, the women pursued up to court. But this has been few and uh, perfect cases. So we still, did, we still need to have a lot in order to move together equally. But women in parliament also move. For example, when we change the, uh, the CPA to the constitution, 25% we made sure it was translated into the constitution. And then when it came into election laws, the women stood very firm and coordinated 
with the women parliamentarians who were in Khartoum because the, the, the election law was being made in Khartoum. So the women coordinated with the women parliamentarians who were in Khartoum, both the southerners and the northerners, to see to it that this 25% is translated into election law. And indeed, this is one of the practices that the women achieved. It was translated. That is why we have what they call the women, uh, women seat. So women seat was accorded right away from the office. That 25% of all the seats will go, and women only will compete for this. So if there are parties who are competing, they will only list women to compete for this women's uh, seat. So it will be a party list, and only women will be to that seat. And that actually helped women not to, to gain only the 25%. They managed to gain more than 25% because other women came through the geographical uh, and the party list. The other thing is uh, during the Rwanda Life Peace Agreement, the civil society actually worked with some of the women parliamentarians to coordinate how can they, the women parliamentarians were not invited to the discussion of the Rwanda Life Peace Agreement. But the civil society who were uh, invited, they worked with the women uh, parliamentarian caucus and they kept on uh, the asking questions. Now we are going into this meeting. What should we say? Now we are... So women were coordinating. And I'm pleased that the women who sat in the hall pushed and pushed very hard to get the 35% accepted in the revitalized peace agreement. It was not the civil society alone. It was the backdrop of the other women also. The women parliamentarians were uh, part of it. For, as I said, up to now, we need to do more for the women to really be drivers of change in terms of gender equality. Because uh, men don't accept we can live in a society where men don't see women as their equals. One time in parliament, one representative of the of one community raised an issue. And then one man got up to say, by the way, women do not have belly. In the parliament. So all the women got up and said, What do you mean you don't mind to do? Yeah. That by tradition, a woman is not supposed to get up and talk in public. A woman is not to stand in front of men. A woman is not to walk. Even if you are going for hunting, a woman is to walk at the back. If you go in front, that is a, a bad woman. You know, some silly traditions that people can throw away, but some men still hang on it. And some of them are in the parliament. Another time, uh, women in the parliament also raised the issue of the, this huge number of cattle being paid as a dowry. And then the man would say, well, I, I already bought you. Then the women were saying, now we need to, to change this customary law about marrying, paying the dowry. Yes, you could pay dowry, but let the dowry be limited by the law. The men all got up. Even those who cannot afford dowry, they were shouting the women down. This is a customary law. You cannot bring it in the parliament. If you want to discuss it, you go and discuss it at your community level. So you see some of these difficulties that women in the parliament have. But the most important thing, really, to make women uh, be drivers of gender equality, women need to get educated. Even those who are already in parliament, they need to get educated as honorable Nancy about the constitution of this of South Sudan, about the customary law, about the traditional law, and about the constitutions of other neighboring countries, so that they can discuss and also argue with an informed uh, uh, situation. Secondly, we really need to be, build confidence of our women. So that once they stand up to talk, no man should shut them down. Because in parliament, you can raise your hand and say, I don't agree. But you don't just let up and say, oh, no, no, we don't accept that. So if a, a woman raises the point, and another man got up and said, I don't agree with that woman, and if the point is really for advancing women, another woman should get up and say, no, what my sister said is the right one and we agree with it and if several women do that 
that will pass. But okay. we but I was sorry, sorry to cut you short. Remember, we have uh, other questions. Right. That, you know? yeah. Thank you for your able submission on question number one. But maybe just to to, to say uh, just two things on, on the, the legislative uh, responsibility of women parliamentarians. Why why is it so difficult to come up with a prohibitive clause on some of these customary laws? Or norms that are very discriminatory against women, and is, is there a possibility of having these customs codified such that then we are able to pick out which one is it should you should have some sort of a unanimous agreement on some of these laws? I don't know if that is possible in the parliament. Can we have a prohibitive clause as fast as possible? Because when you look at the laws in place, like Dr. Ann initially mentioned, we have the Local Government Act, we have the Constitution. It seems we are in agreement in form of the laws that try to support gender equality. But the implementation is where the issue has been. <coughs> so why can we come up with a prohibitive clause? And is there a possibility to modify these customs? Possibilities are there always. The difficulties will be implementation. There will always be possibilities of quantifying uh, laws that are not good for the community and that those which are good for the community. The possibilities are there. And there are actually the constitution already has given, uh, has given us the rights. In, in, in many articles, you find that, like Article 16, that talks of uh, equal participation of women. And you find in other articles, Article 38, uh, Article 37, that talks of economic, uh, uh, equal economic empowerment of women. Article 38, that talks of equal education of women. Article uh, 39, that talks of family rights, so that a woman also has a right in the family. And uh, the environmental rights, that uh, a woman also has the right to live in a, in, a, in a clean environment, and this is very broad, uh, what does it mean, clean environment? So those, those are already in the Constitution. What is not happening is the implementation. As Dr. Hanna said, we need another set of guiding rules that enforces the, the, the Constitution. There should be another set of guiding rules that would enforce the Constitution so that uh, the Constitution is implemented and that there's nobody above the Constitution. And nobody could say if, if the constitution said equal rights, everybody should accept equal rights. Nobody could say no. This is the tradition says a man is higher than a woman. So we need another set of uh, laws that implements that. But the implementation of these laws are in the not in the parliament. Implementation are in the executive. So the, when the parliament passes the law. The executive is supposed to pick now from the law which one relates to their ministry and implement it. And then they can use the constitution as the backdrop. So this, this is what you Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Betty. Well, let's move on to your question number two. Question number two What role can the women parliamentarians play in ensuring that the customary law is not depriving women of their rights? What strategy can the women in the parliament use, and how will this strategy be accepted by all the women in the parliament? There are a lot of strategies that uh, women can use in order to change the situation, uh, but I wouldn't say all the strategies will be accepted by all the, the, the women, but could be accepted by majority of the women. First of all, you know, raising awareness very important. It's a strategy that is very strong, that you, you continuously talk about the issue, so that you raise awareness that the issue is wrong and it needs to change. So if you continuously talk about it and every woman in the parliament uh, uh, talks about it, I think men will begin to, to listen also. And implementers of uh, laws also will, will begin to listen. Now here, the women caucus plays a great role. The women caucus to actually from time to time bring the women together, look at what is being discussed or what is happening in the society, discuss it and bring it to the parliament. 
if it is already in the constitution, they should just raise it that this, this article in the constitution says this, and this is not happening, and we would like to see it happen. Then the parliament will direct the relevant executive who, who implements such a law. The parliamentarians will not also just sit in the parliament because if, from time to time, every three months, they are given an opportunity to go to their constituencies to, to see what is happening, discuss with them. And that's the opportunity for them to go and begin raising and continue raising awareness within the community, especially the chiefs that are uh, the lawmakers in the villages. So they must, they must also have a uh, close relationship with uh, the people on the ground so that uh, issues which are happening on the ground can easily or immediately be uh, they are informed that they can immediately also raise it in the parliament and discuss it and come up with a, 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 a resolution of how to handle it. So raising awareness is one of the uh, uh, strategies that we need. And then campaign. Really women must have a campaign, open campaign against the customary laws which are not good. So it, it must now be a continuous campaign. It's like uh, when women begin to sing the song, they will, they will listen. So women caucus must now coordinate with the women caucuses of the states and the women associations, the civil societies. Then they must now organize campaign against uh, gender inequality. Particularly, they can pick out what are the traditions that are still harming people. So that uh, this goes into the uh, ears of the people and also can be discussed in the palace. And resolutions have been made about Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Uh, Honorable Chair, I'm going to Question number three says, the lack of women independence by tradition has been one of the greatest threats to women progress. What could be some of the mechanisms to promote and guarantee women advancement in the face of the customary laws? I think here we need your opinions, like various opinions. There's a similar question to all the three panelists. Yeah. I think the question is also similar to what I've just uh, discussed. What are the strategies uh, for women to promote women's rights? Uh, is this, they're, 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 the traditions that uh, stops women from progressing can really be addressed if everybody is aware, as I said before. There should be lead women who will raise awareness. And I did this lead women, I still go back to the women uh, parliamentary caucus, that they really need to pull up their socks now. And also in the parliament we have the committee, the specialized committee for gender. That committee also needs to be very active in uh, bringing out the inequalities that we see. And then in the parliament itself, some of the strategies the parliamentarians could use is to enact legislative uh, uh, laws that would improve, take out the bad ones if they are still in the constitution and replace them with the good ones in the parliament. They should enact these laws. And then make sure that when they enact these laws, these laws are laid uh, down. And then they should also ensure that they study both the strategic law and the customary law and begin to repeal those which are not uh, helping. So that we can now replace them with those who can help advance the, the, the women's uh, uh, rights. And we should also be aware, as I said, that the CPA had uh, made um, the CPA is a plurality uh, law. So our, our, our constitution is also basing its laws on both the customary, religious, sometimes, and then our common civil law. But we need to study this because we just get up and begin to argue that this law is not good. For example, there are certain uh, laws which could, uh, could be Islamic law. And then we say, no, 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 this is Islamic law and it's not good for us. Also. We need to understand what is that law. Is it for the benefit of the community or is it not? If we don't understand it and we just get up and argue about it, 
because this is what men are saying now that women are just shouting uh, women's right women's right what are the women's rights that women want so we need to be very specific we, are, we should understand what is in the constitution we should understand what is in the community understand what is in the society and then line up the first one to say this we need to throw out if they are not in the constitution because customary laws are not rigid they must not be practiced but we also need to enhance the chiefs who practice this law. if we don't train the chiefs if we don't raise awareness to the chiefs if we don't empower the chiefs we are still not doing justice to the women so those are some of them Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll be moving on to our question number four. Question number four is again about the current constitutional making process that is taking place in the country, and we would like to know uh, how the female parliamentarians show that they are involved in this constitutional making process and ensure that we are we have the greatest achievement of the Bill of Rights as part of our constitution. Yeah, well, first of all, we need to understand that the, the permanent constitutional making process uh, is in the hand, not freely in the hand of the parliament or South Sudanese. Because uh, now the, the, the permanent constitutional making process has started, and uh, I, I don't know of any women parliamentarian who have been invited. Uh, to be a member of the permanent constitution making. When they were still writing the concept note and being the preliminary, the women parliamentarians were all invited. I was also part of it. Uh, we did a lot of discussions. But now, when they started the process, they started burying up uh, people. One is since the, the peace agreement have given provisions which women can be members of the permanent uh, making constitution. The, the civil society would have uh, four women, and then the SPLM will have three women, and other parties may have one or two. And uh, they didn't mention the parliament. However, the parliament plays a very great role. As the uh, Honorable Anna said, the parliament can, can, can play its role without being directly members of this particular committee. By going out to the communities, talking to the communities, informing them, raising aware that the parliament makes a constitution, because they are going to consult the communities. Although they say they will use a lot uh, of materials from the national dialogue, but they will still also go to the communities and consult the communities. So the parliament, the parliamentary, especially the women, they have a role here to go out to their communities, sit down with them uh, after they have understood the constitution itself, the, the old one, the customary law, and what are the, the traditional laws that are hindering their pro progress. And then tell them now, when this team comes to you, please raise this. And they should also take from the community what they think if the community did not raise it and the, the committee did not write it because this was the, the constitution will come to the parliament in the end so if they see that what they, the community wanted to be there or what they think should be there is not there they have the, the right to raise this at that time so that it doesn't pass the law should not pass without them filtering in and seeing that this constitution because it's permanent if it is going to be reviewed, it may be after 10 years or more. So they have to see that every nitty gritty that uh, promotes the rights of women are there when it is brought to the parliament for, for discussions. And before that happens, they must visit the communities and discuss with the communities. So they have a big role there. Thank you, Honorable. Thank you, Honorable just to to, to give a, a, a just a comment on, on that part we, we all are as honorable members you are aware that uh, no instrument becomes legally binding unless it passes through the hands of parliament 
And it is also my hope that this constitution will first go through the hands of parliamentarians before it finally gets to the other stages. For example, the executive will have up until the end. Now, as the constitution will be coming into the, to the parliament, I think this is where we will have the female parliamentarians to really look out for those clauses that will then help or at least try as much as possible to ensure that the customary laws that are not respectful enough of women are taken off. So this will be, this will be something that we will be looking at. This is something that we will be following up to ensure that because this, like you said, it is going to be our permanent constitution, and this is like the last bullet for us women to at least look at it critically. And our hope is on the female parliamentarians because I'm sure at least you will have a touch of the constitution more than the women who are outside of the parliament. So this is the comment that I would uh, I would like to put across. Uh, moving on to your last question. Uh, yeah, before, before you move on, yes, I, yes. I, I, I would like to add here that yes. really I'm very happy that we have quite a lot of um, a good number of, of female lawyers from the discussions so I, I saw last week I'm, I'm really very pleased that we have the female lawyers now in South Sudan. In the past we didn't have them so we didn't have people to contact with. I would really would like to see the women caucus uh, already they, they had initial an initial uh, contact but I would like to see the women caucus having very close uh, 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 working relations with the Women Lawyers Association. Because there will be a, a, a big number of women lawyers in that uh, constitution making process. And I think uh, JMEC has invited uh, a number of them. So they will be able also to inform, not only lawyers understand the law. So we need the women lawyers to come also to help the women parliamentarians understanding the law and understanding the constitution making process. So being a member of parliament is one thing, but knowing the process and, and, and effectively contributing to the process needs a lot of education, a bit of training, a bit of awareness raising. So I, I really would uh, be pleased if the uh, Women Parliamentary Caucus could get uh, in touch with the Women Lawyers Association so that at this process there is a continuous training going on among the Women Parliamentarians. Thank you very much, Honorable Betty. Our last question for today for you, Honorable Betty, is the lack of women independence by tradition has been one of the greatest threats to women's progress. What would be some of the mechanisms to promote and guarantee women advancement in the face of the customary laws? I think this is another question that is cutting across also the difference for today's discussion. Yeah, lack of women's independence comes about because of lack of appreciating women, lack of understanding the, the law, lack of understanding the role women play. So for, for this to be easy, again, I think there must be a lot of awareness raising that uh, women are equal. And during the war, actually, women took the larger part of, of family uh, keeping formula bringing even the nation so why is it that when we're in time of peace now we begin to relegate the women at the time? so we need to go back on the drawing board and say men yes god has created us sexually different but in terms of uh, building the country we build the country equally but the, the, the discussion can should not continue to be among women alone. Because so far, for the last 10 years I've seen, we women, we talk among ourselves. Oh, we are being uh, relegated or we are being marginalized. Or we talk among ourselves. Already we know our issues. We know we are being marginalized. We know this inequality between us and men. But who are the perpetrators of this inequality? So we need to move on now to talk to the men and say, men, we now need to have an equal society that has equal voices both for men and women. We need to have a, a society that concerns not only men, but also concerns the women so that we move together. So 
independence would not come, we did not get our independence on the single South Sudan. So women will not get independence on the single plate if they don't fight for it. So we need the women to get out. It is not only on the neck of the women parliamentarians, but the women in general. Women civil society will play a very good role here together with the parliamentarians because they have the voice. They can speak loudly. So we need to really break down this bone that ties women and uh, make them not be free to contribute to the nation building like me. Thank you very much, Honorable Betty Achan Ogwaro. You have come to the end of your submission. Thank you so much for your able submission for the different questions that you've delivered unto you. And now we'll be moving on to our third panelist for today's uh, discussion. Our third panelist is Honorable Hannah Lona. Honorable Hannah Lona, I'll go straight to your question. Question number one is, are women's rights human rights? And do you think that a summary law in South Sudan is depriving women from their human fundamental rights to have access to fair trials? Please explain. Indeed, it is great, but first I want to thank God for this day and uh, being an honor to be among my great mentors, Dr. Anne and Dr. Betty. It's my pleasure to South Sudan Women's International, uh, Intellectual Forum. The question is very clear. The women's rights indeed is a uh, human rights because women and the human, they are human beings. There's no difference. A woman is a human being. So indeed, women rights are the same as uh, human rights. And uh, the customary law in South Sudan actually deprives so many of women rights from their fundamental rights to have, to have access to fair trial. According to the Constitution of Western Equatoria, said the Transitional Constitution of Western Equatoria, Article 20, indeed it is true. The trial that was, is there in South Sudan is not fair to women because of the customary law and the mindset that our customary law is based on. Because basically, women are denied during marriages even to decide on the dowries of their daughter. This is also the violation and violation of a woman rights to decide also how much my daughter will get married and at which age that women will be married. They also inheritance, especially when you lost your husband, women are deprived from that right to access uh, the property of their late, including children. The only thing that our society does is to make sure children are left to a widow to care for, to bring up a child as a single parent. But in cases of property, assets, whatever resources that your husband has, I think a woman is deprived from that. So indeed, this automatically takes us to some of the fundamental rights of access because basically in fair trial, in cases of any case that happens between a man and a woman, a woman is not fairly tried because her rights is denied. Mostly said, you are a woman, you are married. Who are you to talk about that? You are denied some of your access, some of your properties, even you are denied to say. So indeed, in South Sudan, fundamental rights of women are denied to violence. Thank you, Honorable Hannah. How can then the women of South Sudan forge a path for women's rights in customary law? Or what role can the state legislative assembly play in ensuring that the women's rights are respected? You know, women in South Sudan has all that role to forge their path and they have started it already. That's why today we are on this panel, we have been talking. Last week, we have seen our young lawyers discussing on the same topic about the customary law. This is already a pathway 
of how we can come out of this customary laws which are not good for us. But as Dr. Anna said, some of the customary laws are actually very good that we need to go by and it guides our society, but some of them cannot help. So in that case, I think it's, we cannot move with some of this bad, cultural, uh, bad customary law that prohibits our right as women. But women in South Sudan have started and are moving forward. That's why today we are talking about the customary law, some of them which prohibits our rights, some of it which also affects us negatively. But women parliamentarians has a great role to play to ensure that women's rights are respected. One through enacting laws that prohibit a harmful customary laws against women in the society, even within our communities. Another point, there is need to create more awareness. As uh, Honorable Betty talked about, our chiefs need to know that women have vital rights in a society and their rights must be respected, their views can be respected as a human being in a society. Because in our society in South Sudan, we have single parents that brought up leaders that we have seen. These are women without a man. They are widows, they are single parents that have brought even bigger people who are taking positions without a man. So I think uh, women parliamentarians have that great role in creating awareness, in enacting laws, and making sure that women, uh, women issues are brought onto the table. And also the treaties that we have must be respected and implemented in South Sudan. And that cannot come only through the efforts of women parliamentarians to see that it is brought up and it's talked about. We should not be keeping quiet. Women must talk about these treaties, these documents, like Mobutu Protocol. We have 1325, but I'm so proud in South Sudan we have been talking about these things and it is helping. That's why we are trying to see so many things are changing. And also women parliamentarians must be on decision-making tables, where decisions are made, this is where by now there is legislation. Because if only laws are enacted in parliament, what about the implementation of the laws? The implementation of the laws has been done by the executive. So if we have women, that will be there to make sure that the laws are implemented I am sure there is nothing that is going to affect. But the customary laws that promote the rights of women, not all the customary laws, because some of the customary laws are prohibited. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Honorable Hana. Thank you. Like you mentioned that clearly about, I think all of you mentioned that particular aspect of uh, implementation of our laws uh, being within the confines of the executive. Yes, uh, 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 as a government, there is that to be division. We have the executive, the parliament, and the division. However, we also understand that they are supposed to work together closely and there should be checks and balances. So assuming that now the executive is not implementing some of the laws, like we've already seen practically in South Sudan, some of these are our laws are actually well documented and well recorded. Unfortunately, it is not being documented. What can Parliament, is there a possibility, is there a way that Parliament can use this authority under checks and balances and put some bit of pressure to ensure that some of these documents are, are applicable within our society? Charity, At the state level. Charity, you, you have said so, but one thing that also we must put in mind is we have weak systems. I have to be honest, because all of our laws are documented, but they are not implemented, including the judiciary, which is also one of the arms of the government that will help. Because in roles and responsibility of the parliament, if laws are passed, the executive has to implement that laws. It must be implemented. But later on, also, it goes back to a political party, which also affects the implementation of our laws. Because in reality, when a law is passed, a minister is not acting to us or not implementing, the parliament has to call that minister back and question the minister. 
why you are not doing so and so. And in case if a minister or the person in charge of is not acting correctly, the steps and procedures that will be taken against vote of no confidence must be. But now, if you can see, I can remember might be in parliaments of 20, 2005, 2010, somehow that you can see. But currently, you can see, realize that there's a problem. There is a problem that we as parliamentarians need to address. We need to come back to ourselves and check what is wrong with us. We are there representing the voice of the people. If laws are not implemented, implemented, it is affecting the old citizens who have voted us to the parliament. Now how do you expect to come back? This is where the challenges remain. I expect one day if a minister is moved, is 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 a uh, is cast a vote of no confidence against a minister and be removed, that is whereby most of them will be afraid. But I will remember sometimes when we are in the parliament when in the state, there is a minister that we say it because as parliamentarians, this minister have not performed. Last time, last time, at this time, we are not allowing him. You, governor, this minister will not be appointed. And I'm proud that the, mean, the governor listened to us. But currently, with the revitalized agreement, now there is no checks and balance on the minister. I even don't know how are we going to proceed from this. Because if a minister misbehaves, how is the minister accountable to the parliament? Because you have not even checked his appointment. So this is where the problem comes in. You, we can see now there is high range of gender-based violences. What is the parliament doing? Though the parliament is just uh, reconstituted, I believe might be after that they will start acting. But parliament needs to be strengthened. Uh, the roles and responsibility of checks and balance needs to be strengthened. We need to have motive in order to pressure the implementing bodies for the laws that we have in South Sudan. Thank you very much, Kanara Mohana. I think that was the elaborate explanation that I was looking for because then it helps the viewers to uh, assess and make the follow ups that they want to have. Now, let's go to question number three. How can the women at the state legislative assembly work together with the women at the national legislative assembly to ensure the protection of rights of women of every harmful tradition? Do you think there is a gap between the women at the state and those at the national level? Indeed, definitely it's our mandate to work together as parliamentarians because there is no difference between a woman parliamentarian at the national level and the state level. We are all representing women constituency. There is no way out that we need to work differently. That's why women issues is cross-cutting all over the country and even worldwide, we say globally, and because whatever that affects a woman in late states affects also a woman in Eastern Equatoria, either in Western Equatoria. The only challenge remains, all of us come from different political background, social background, religious background, and economical background, which contributes sometimes negatively in our working together. Because then sometimes people look at the classes, people look at the political color, people look also at their interests. That is whereby it creates a gap. But also, there are ways that we can bridge the gap. One of it is change the mindset of a woman, parliamentarians, that for us to work, work effectively, there is need women at the national level has to look also back. Respect the women at the state parliament so that the issues at the state level can flow. We need to have a both or a two-way flow of information. Women at the grassroots level is a strength to women at the national level, and women at the national level is a pillar to the women parliamentarians at the state level. That is where, by now, we will try our best to move together. When there are problems of customary laws being violated at the state level, 
women at the state level will raise it. If we can't be addressing it at the state level, women at the state level will raise it as a concern to the women parliamentarians at the national level, either through women parliamentary caucus or not through our various caucuses because we have representative of women MPs from our different constituency at the national level. And that uh, issue will be addressed. Another point for it is women must table. For us to, to bridge that gap, we must table private members bill on an, one concern. That also brings our ideas, our issues together. Because if uh, there is an issue at the state level and there is a bill, at the state level, if it is not implemented automatically, an AP at the national level will table it here and it will be a national issue. There is a gap indeed. Because of the mindset, as I've said, of us coming from different cultural backgrounds, uh, from political backgrounds, but there is a way how to bring it together. Another point is because of sometimes the resources, uh, there is a need that we need to come at least once in a time as women parliamentarians at the national level, the states at the national. Another point to bridge that gap is also, you know, inter-state visits helps a lot in order to bridge, to bridge the gap that we have. It is all not only at the state level, at the national level and the state, also among us women from the states because the issues are different. Because when we talk about the way of marriages, in Western Equatoria, our marriage, our marriage system differs from Lakes State, from Eastern Equatoria. And even this is where, but if we always meet together, it bridges the gap. The gap becomes narrow, and we will have a common agenda as women of South Sudan. Thank you very much, Honorable Hannah Lona, for that uh, elaborate uh, submission. Your fourth question is also on the permanent petitioner making process that is currently ongoing and what would be the role of the female parliamentarians in the process just to ensure that a bill of rights is achieved or is clearly brought out in the current permanent petitioner making. Look, Charity, uh, in the process of the permanent constitution making, you know, when we have a permanent constitution in this nation, I think we'll be safe. And this permanent constitution must include all the rights of each and every person, including people with disability. It must be there. People with special needs, women, children themselves. But currently, I can say women parliamentarians has that access. But one thing for us to see, you know, always in committees that are formed, women becomes minority. I fail to understand. The, R, the RACC is clear, it talks about the 35%. But when you come to South Sudan, it is not always realized. It's not even implemented. Women ask to come out and say, we are not there. Why women are not there? I don't know whether in South Sudan, people don't, doesn't see the constitution or the laws that are put or is just sidelining women. This is where I did not know. But at this time, it must be an opportunity for us as women in South Sudan and female parliamentarians to make sure that the views, the rights of women is enshrined in the permanent constitution and be implemented. One thing, the number of, of women in the permanent constitution making process is also limited. And the only opportunity for us as women is to lobby, to strengthen our lobbying capacity so that at least whatever that we have must be included in the permanent constitution making process. Sometimes we look at us only as women, but for me, I will see men are also vital. Not all men is against women's rights. But sometimes we women are against our, ourselves. I have to say so because there's a time that we have been discussing on issue of marriageable age. But unfortunately, I came to realize other women are 
encouraging and promoting a girl has to be married at the age of 12 to 16. What the hell? This is unconstitutional and violation of rights and abuse of a child. But then we must understand. I have to say as parliamentarians, if we don't see our number much in the, the permanent constitution making process, we need to strengthen our lobbying capacity. We need to advocate through civil society. And we should stand on that so that at least our rights have been enshrined in the constitution making process. Dr. Ann mentioned something very beautiful. We need to also visit our constituency. Who are our constituency? It's the women constituencies that we have, but also it comes also there is issues of insecurity that sometimes you cannot access your constituency and uh, issues of resources also contributes also negatively towards that. But still, as women parliamentarians, we have the opportunity because the Bill of Rights that is enshrined in our constitution must be part and parcel. Wherever there are gaps in the transitional constitution that we have, the gaps that are in a revitalized agreement must be covered in the permanent constitution. The time is now we must start in order to start looking into that, how best our views, our voices of our women from the grassroots must be included. Not only that, even the process, we and the people from the constitution making process must go down and listen to the voices of women. As I speak, I know that we have viewers. We need to work hard as women in South Sudan globally to make sure that our Views are there so that at least this time we have things that we have achieved through the constitution or the permanent constitution that we will have. Thank you very much, Honorable Hannah. To our dear panelists, I would request that you give me more of your 15 minutes. We were supposed to end at exactly 1.30, uh, rather 5.30. That is uh, one hour and 30 minutes. But we are left with just one question for Honorable Hannah, and then we'll go forward to the concluding remarks. So, Honorable Hannah, your last question is, what are the challenges facing our law or our legal system in South Sudan, especially at the state level, and what are your recommendations moving forward? We have a lot of challenges of the law system in South Sudan, especially in the state. You know, lack of implementation of the laws that we have is another problem. It's very key because if the laws are not implemented, how do you expect us to move? We will not move forward if the laws are not respected. Any crime that has been conducted, there's no legal process being taken off. A person will be put today in a jail, tomorrow is out. Where are the laws? I have to say that uh, ignorance also contributes. Mostly, sometimes people did not even read the constitution that we have or even the scarcity of the copies of the constitution to our people and are not aware of whatever laws, whatever articles that are enshrined in the constitution. So I will say at least it is very important. The insecurity that we have in the country contributes also to lack of the implementation of the laws that we have. I will recommend that let us implement the laws because this reflects the image of the nation or either of the state. When laws are respected, no man is above the law, but the law is above any man. Whoever you are, regardless of your color, regardless of your party, regardless of your sex, the law is above all. We need to create more awareness to our people concerning the laws that we have. Until today, as we have the revitalized agreement at our hand, Many people did not know about the rights of women. And then how do you go and create awareness? To disseminate about, disseminate the laws, we have security. There is need that war must stop in this nation, and then we need to embrace peace so that our laws can be uh, implemented accordingly. Provision, availability of the copies of the Constitution must be availed to all of us. The government has that mandate. We have the civil society, those who are responsible for it, at least, so that our daughters, our mothers, our girls, our aunties are protected by this law. If we don't protect, I think 
if we don't have them, it's not it's strengthen the judiciary system in this country. If the judiciary system is strengthened, I think, and then also there is need to give an open uh, freedom. Each institution must work accordingly, according to the freedom of that institution to emphasize or to exercise their powers. The judiciary, if it is working and implementing the laws without any hindrance, I believe things will move well. Any person, whether big or small, whether old or young, you committed a crime, the law is above you. Again, I believe we will move well and we will have a better South Sudan. We have come to the last, uh, that, that was the last uh, question to our panelists. And uh, just before we end our show for today, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you, our great panelists for today's discussion, for your experienced submissions in uh, regards to customary law, the constitution, and the role of women in the parliament in supporting women rights in the Republic of South Sudan. I would also like to thank our viewers all over the world. Thank you for turning up in big numbers and sharing with us for this discussion. I would like to thank the team members working behind the scene, especially the UN women for providing us with the space and the internet to have this uh, discussion. Uh, we have come to the end of our show for today. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everyone. Good night. Thank you very much, and may God bless all of you.